Hello, everybody. I'm Pastor Steve Green. This is Bratton Word of Faith Church. My wife Penny and I pastor here. Today is Sunday, June 28th. Our message title today is Loving Others But Not Being Manipulated. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, your presence makes all the difference in the world, and I believe that together it's going to be a very profitable time for us. I'm excited about the message today. It's a message that is critical to our lives. It has a big impact upon Upon our experience, upon how well we do on the earth. And it's also a subject that hasn't always been easy for me, at least, to articulate, to explain plainly. And I believe we can explain it plainly now, and therefore I'm excited about it. Uh, the main thought that we've been following for the last few weeks is this, is that each one of us has been given a responsibility in life. It's our reason for being. It's the cause that we live for. And this responsibility on an earthly level is to love one another with the love of God. And it's really that simple. We can boil it down to that simple statement, to love one another with the love of God. I said on an earthly level, let me explain. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. He says a simple verse, we love him because he first loved us. And obviously that's where it all begins, is for God so loved the world. He loved us first and as we become conscious and aware and and sensitive to the fact that God loves us as much as he does then it's our it's it's a normal response it's a necessary response for us to love him back and then in verse 21 of 1st John 4 it says this and this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also and so we love him because he first loved us and and a primary way we demonstrate our love for him is we love our brother <clears throat> And so we have a vertical component to the love of God and we have a horizontal component to the love of God. I'm talking about the love of God coming out of us. Is the vertical component is us loving God because he first loved us. The horizontal component is loving one another. And so uh, as we read through the scriptures, what we see uh, throughout the New Testament is our basic earthly commitment described for us. And what that is, is over and over again, as we've said, is we're being exhorted to love one another. That's our earthly responsibility. So we, uh, as we fulfill that responsibility, there's two main consequences. Number one is that we fulfill our earthly ministry. Uh, we're good ministers to other people. And number two is that things go well for us on the earth. We're blessed. This is part of what we call salvation. And so obviously this is something that's of, of a major interest to us because this is going to be the a summary of our life. It's going to describe, you know, did we do it? Did we understand it? Did we get it? And so obviously we want to be able to say yes to all of those different things. Now there's a complicating factor. It's, it's a major complicating factor. We've been talking about boundaries and one of the key aspects to boundaries is it's human nature to want to interfere in another person's area of responsibility. The reason that is is because of, uh, according to the Bible, it's because of ungodly desires. It's because of fear. So there's this tendency. It's a common one. It sometimes is just done in little ways, in minor ways, sometimes in major ways, but it's not unusual at all for uh, a person wanting to interfere with another person's area of responsibility, meaning wanting to control or manipulate or for something because of their own wishes. And, and so there's going to be two main responses uh, that we can, uh, two main inappropriate responses that we can give to that. One would be to step back. One would be to uh, disengage from such a person. It would be to uh, want to protect ourselves, to close our heart, to, to just not uh, have that any kind of closeness to that person. And, and although that might be effective in uh, prohibiting them from controlling us, it's very ineffective as far as us uh, fulfilling our responsibility to love that person. So then our, our calling to be a good minister is being frustrated and our calling to enjoy the life and the blessings of God is also being frustrated. Uh, it's like that needle that we sometimes use to illustrate, a needle on a dial uh, that really needs to be pointing upward and where upward indicates that we're getting it exactly right. But the problem is we can miss it one way or we can miss it the other way. The first way is as we've just described is by withdrawing of 
by disengaging but uh, another way to miss it is to go too far uh, and to overshoot the mark and that is to have an open heart to to want to love another person but because of um, because of our open-heartedness and perhaps not being as wise as we should, we uh, make ourselves uh, vulnerable to other people's manipulations. And that is just as ineffective as the first way. Uh, in that, if we do that, then our, we're being frustrated both ways again. We're, we're not fulfilling our ministry, we're not ministering to people effectively, and also we're not being blessed as both God and we wish to be blessed. So there has to be a way for us to be uh, open-hearted, to be true lovers of people, and at the same time not to be manipulated, not to allow ourselves to be manipulated. That's not in our best interest, it's also not in the other person's best interest. So that's the subject that we're going to be looking at today and that's the one like I say I'm excited about it. Before we go any further though I want to share some quick announcements. If you wish to give an offering today we appreciate that. We uh, are glad for your generosity. It makes a big difference. Uh, the most common way that people give is by email money transfer. Our address for that is donation at bwofc.com. There's also a link on our website for giving by credit card. We want to draw your attention to our refresh messages. Uh, they've switched a little bit. We now have still three a week, five minutes each, but now Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, as you know, they uh, take a key point from Sunday's message and, and bring it back to your memory and refresh it to your memory for the purpose of knowing it and doing it and being blessed. Uh, we invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to like our Facebook page, to share this broadcast on Facebook. For those wishing to be physically present with us, we invite you to do that on Sunday mornings. And uh, just to let you know what's going on, if you haven't been back recently, is we're disinfecting uh, commonly cut, touched surfaces, rather. Uh, we have hand sanitizer, we have a station there, we have face masks if you would like one. We ask that you observe physical distancing and we also ask that if you're not feeling well, perhaps uh, sniffles, a cough, anything like that, then please enjoy the service from home uh, and all of it just in an attitude of love toward each other. Okay, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would help me to speak this plainly and clearly and boldly as it needs to be spoken, that you would help all of us to be of a ready mind and an understanding heart and to grasp it quickly and to grasp it deeply, Father God. Help us to be excellent at doing it and bringing glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, love and fear are adversaries. Uh, going back to the very beginning, many of you are familiar, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. Adam and Eve, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So Adam and Eve are hiding behind trees. Now, verse uh, 9, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And so he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. So they were hiding because they were afraid. Uh, they had sinned, and they had fallen, and it was this original sin. And uh, having died spiritually, uh, Adam and Eve eventually died physically also, but in the first place they died spiritually. And so we read in Romans 5 and verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, that would include physical death, but first and foremost it's speaking of spiritual death. And we just read back in Genesis chapter 3, a primary characteristic of spiritual death, being disconnected from God, of being dead to God, is having a fear, being fearful of God and fearful of life in general. It says, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So now fear is human nature. That's a sad fact. It's an unfortunate fact. None of us would want that to be true, but we need to face the fact that it is true. Therefore, fear can uh, thread its way through our relationships. A heart motivation for developing friendly, outwardly friendly relationships may be various fears. Fear of harm, we don't wish to be hurt. Uh, fear of lack, of not having the various things that we need. Fear of rejection by people. 
fear of failure in life. And, and because of various fears, such as the ones we just mentioned, uh, we can be prompted to want to be nice to people, to, uh, to create an environment, a friendly environment around us that compensates for our fears. But this is, uh, although we're being friendly, which is good, it's not the right heart motivation. It's being motivated by fear. This is, uh, again, not an uncommon thing. It's human nature. So the Word of God is the cure for this situation. The Word of God cleanses our heart when we believe it, when we act upon it. The Word of God cleanses our heart and therefore it also cleanses our motivations. Let's read a couple of scriptures on this. 1 John 2 and verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, we're talking about the fact that, that the Word of God is the cure for our natural and tendencies to some degree, maybe a little, maybe a lot, but it's a natural tendency to have fear wind its way uh, into our lives, into our relationships. The way that we cure ourselves uh, from that is by the Word of God. So again, 1 John 2, 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. So as we learn the Word of God, as we practice it, as we do it, as we get better at it, then the love of God is being perfected in us. Us. And then 1 John 4, 18, this is a verse that we love, you've heard it before. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. So that perfect love is, first of all, God's perfect love toward us, but not just that. We love Him because He first loved us. But this perfect love is referring primarily to how we then love one another. And, and the fact that it's being called perfect love is, the, is uh, referring to our ability to develop it, to grow in it, to become better at it, to perfect it. And as we are perfected in the love of God, in our, in our love walk, in our behavior toward other people, the impact of that love walk is that it eliminates fear from our heart. And now we're being motivated by love toward other people. A lot of times it'll look very similar on the outside, but rather now, uh, instead of being motivated by fear, we're being motivated by love to care for other people. Perfect love casts out fear. We can talk about love all day long, and the world does talk a good talk, uh, but if we're still under the grip of fear, then the talk really isn't producing any of the results that we want in life. So. Let's look at a couple of scriptures, examples of fear and love colliding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, this is from the Amplified Version, this is the second half of verse 5, love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Now, taking no account of evil done to us does not mean that we don't notice that evil is being done, uh, but rather it means that we do not repay evil for evil. We take no account of the evil done to us. So the reason we're reading that particular scripture and the one that's going to follow it here in just a moment is because uh, this is where love and fear collide. Uh, these, this scripture and the next one, these scriptures are talking about love, what love will do, what love won't do. Love takes no account of the evil done to it, pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not insist on its own rights or its own way. And, and so one response of fear to that would be that that can't work. That's too hard for one thing. It's unnatural. It's impractical. Uh, it will not produce the results I want. It'll just make me vulnerable to other people's evil intentions. I'll be naive. I'll be um, a sitting duck. I'm going to be taken advantage of. Uh, this is one response to that type of scripture. So rather than responding in faith, it's entirely possible we might respond in fear to reading that. Now here's another scripture just uh, two verses removed from the first one we read. It's still 1 Corinthians 13 now, verse 7, also in the Amplified, the first part of the verse. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. Love is ever ready to believe the best of every person. There again, that's extremely challenging. Ever ready to believe the best. Uh, life may have taught us some harsh lessons. Uh, I'm sure it has, all of us. We've been through numerous, numerous experiences, many of them unpleasant, not all of them very loving. Um, 
people, I imagine it's been countless number of times you have not been loved very well. Perhaps when you were a student in school and, and in a whole variety of different uh, circumstances. And so we've learned in life to have our guard up. To, to not believe the best of other people. Maybe, maybe some of us have, we could even say, have been taught to almost believe the worst of other people uh, because of some things that have happened to us. So again, this can be potentially very threatening. It can appear naive, impractical, um, not workable. Uh, so one way that fear can impact our response to these verses is to cause us to back off, is we object to it. We're not going to do it. No way. And another way that fear can impact us is that we can agree, seemingly agree, perhaps as far as we're aware, we're agreeing with these scriptures. We do them. We intend to do them. We try to do them. But, but we're, <clears throat> again, making ourselves too vulnerable and unwittingly, um, unwisely uh, exposing ourselves to the evil intentions and to the manipulations, to the controlling devices of other people, and it just results in, in harm. And <clears throat> uh, this is really uh, continuing in fear. It is, it is not a response of faith, but it is uh, the being we mentioned earlier, the different types of fear, fear of rejection, fear of harm, fear of lack. Um, <clears throat> uh, and if we think that we're following the scriptures, but we're still yielding to fears, we don't want the person to discard us, we don't want them to not like us, we don't want them to reject us. Um, and so we're being cooperative. We might feel like we're loving according to the Word of God, but it, it really isn't. We're not hitting the target. We're not hitting the bullseye on that. So here's where we're getting right to where the rubber hits the road. This is the exciting part. Uh, this is where I believe we can make a clear distinction of what love is and how love works and how we avoid the pitfalls. And we do it through the perspective of boundaries, which we've been talking about so for several weeks. We won't go through all the details of it. But through boundaries, we understand that we each one of us has a property. We're comparing relationships with other people to, to being a property owner. And if I have a relationship with somebody, they're the person uh, in our illustration who's adjacent to us. They have their property. I have mine. And there's a boundary line between it. We need to be aware of and observe the boundary line. And our responsibility or the plot that I stand on, the part that I live on, is my responsibility to love people according to the Word of God. And so as I'm intent upon doing that, as I'm busy doing that, I'm fulfilling my basic calling in life. Now, if other people are trying to control or manipulate or force us into doing things according to their wishes that they would wish us to be a planet in their solar system revolving around their sun or or we could say marching you know to the beat of their drum if that's what people wish to do and they're and they're using either consciously or unconsciously they're using techniques in order to get us to do that that in effect is not us fulfilling our if we were to respond to that, that is not us fulfilling our responsibility, but that instead is a boundary violation. They're, they're not helping us fulfill our responsibility, but they are overstepping their boundaries. They're interfering with our responsibility. Now, this can be tricky because uh, the thing that God is asking us to do, obviously, is to love people. And what do other people want? Uh, generally speaking, uh, perhaps in a distorted way, but generally speaking, what other people want is for us to love them. And so they might try to be pulling that out of us, maybe extorting us, <laughs> using whatever method they can to get us to love them. So on the surface, it might appear, where's the contradiction? Uh, God wants us to love them. They want us to love them. You know, it's all the same thing, except it's not the same thing. In fact, at times it can be wildly different. The motivation is different. The, the, some of the actions may look the same, but they really are as different um, as black and white in many cases and so we need to be able to see that that our motive is not the manipulations of people but it is rather the love of God that is compelling us to do what we do so let's give some examples of what we're talking about uh, examples of, of 
loving people versus being controlled by them and what the difference is. So uh, right from the Bible, James chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? So James is teaching us to be ready to give, to be ready to help. If somebody needed clothing to be warm then, and we had extra clothing, it would be appropriate for us to help them. If they were hungry and they needed food and we had extra food, it would be very appropriate and necessary for us to help feed them. That is what uh, James is teaching us. That's part of what love is. That's part of what faith is, is helping one another. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 to 12 reads like this, For even when we were with you, this is Paul speaking, we commanded you this, that if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Now this is again where it could be a little tricky. I don't believe it's going to be tricky at all for us. But on one hand, we're being told that we ought to share our food. And now on the other hand, we're being told that if a person will not work, then he also should not eat. And, he, and it's speaking of a Christian brother or sister. In verse 11, again, 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. In other words, these are people that are taking advantage of the fact that we're told to help one another. And they're deliberately not working. They could be working. They're able to work, but they're choosing not to work. And instead, they're choosing to try to live off of other people. In verse 12, Paul says, Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and they eat their own bread and not other people's bread. And so there's two sides to the coin. And obviously both sides are true. It is true that their responsibility is to work and not to try to beg uh, or mooch off of other people. That is their responsibility. It's our responsibility if we have a brother or sister in need to help them, but then they're gonna, there's going to be a point where if it appears that they are deliberately um, taking advantage of us, then there comes a time for us to not help them anymore. But rather, we help them in this way by kindly and, and gently but truthfully saying to them that they need to work, and if they don't work, then they shouldn't eat. Now that is, that would be love. That may sound like it's strong, but uh, here's part of what love is. It's a major part of what love is, is we understand that we cannot do other people's responsibility for them. We cannot take responsibility for other people. Uh, and in order for whoever this person is, in order for them to fulfill their uh, calling in life, in order for them to be blessed, in order for them to be successful, they are going to have to fulfill their own responsibility. And love will find a way to effectively as possible say that to them. And we will not be enabling them or supporting them in a self-destructive lifestyle. So both sides of the coin are true. Do we love other people? Yes. Um, should they manipulate us? No. Should we permit them to manipulate us? No. Is it loving to, to uh, remind them of their responsibility in life? Yes, it definitely is because that's the only way they're going to be successful. Uh, so that's example number one. Let's look at another example similar. Uh, talking about uh, ministering to the destitute, people who who may be without clothing or may be adequate clothing or people who may be without uh, adequate food. Uh, I'm thinking of sometimes inner cities. It doesn't have to be inner cities. In our town of Breton, uh, we have a church that has a, a food bank. We don't have it, but they do. And, and, and I think I'll explain as we go um, the reason why. Um, that although we don't have one, we help support the other food bank. And that's what I want to talk about. So when it comes to things like food banks and soup kitchens, that is a way to care for other people. It's a, a way to care for people that are lacking and that don't have and uh, don't have the basic necessities. Um, and it's a way to express love. 
but if we are providing uh, food in a food bank or we're providing a soup or a lunch in a kitchen then then that is not there's no uh, degree of manipulation in that it's just a service we're providing it's it's a care for an, from one human being to another it's a blessing it's a benefit it's a good thing um, but it's done on the terms of the organization that's giving the benefit it, uh, and so it's going to be according to the rules. It's going to be it's going to be in such and such a location. It, uh, if it's a meal being served, it's going to be between you know this hour and that hour. There's going to have to be certain behavior. You can't be fighting with the other people that are going to be eating there. And, and so uh, it's again it's being delivered on the terms of the organization that is delivering the benefit. Now, as opposed to that, we could have panhandling. And I want to be clear. I'm not trying to say whether you should or shouldn't uh, give a small amount to somebody who's panhandling. Um, I just don't view that as my decision to make for you. And, but what I do want to do is be presenting some of the issues to you. So panhandling is a little different. It's probably asking for money. Now money can be used for a multitude of different purposes. It's, it's, um, it's maybe more desired than a meal. Uh, on the part of the person who's lacking, but it gives them more control and, and that's a human thing to want more control and they're wanting for you to do it for them. And now what we have to assess is, is, is this in their best benefit? Um, are we being through their pitch that they're making to us, their, their circumstances that we can see, are they manipulating us? And the answer may be yes. Um, it might be that they, you know, I think we've heard stories of people who um, are good at it and make a lot of money <laughs> and go home and they live in comfortable uh, circumstances and it's just a way for them to trick other people. Now that's not to their benefit nor is it to ours if we're supporting that kind of a lifestyle. Uh, this is a terrible thing I'm about to say, a tragic thing, uh, but uh, we've heard examples, we've traveled in various third world countries of, and, and certainly come across many people that are begging in the streets and sometimes they have children with them and they have crippled children that are with them as a way of indicating their neediness and to try to extract sympathy uh, from the passers-by. And uh, we heard stories that sometimes uh, people would actually maim their own children at a very young age and maim them in order to help uh, make their um, panhandling uh, activities more successful. Uh, and again, we just don't want to be part of that kind of thinking, that kind of lifestyle, or supporting it. Um, I heard a story one time of a man here in North America who outside of his home, I think he lived in an urban area, outside of his home he found a, a homeless person and he was a Christian man and thinking himself to be uh, doing the right thing, he invited the man into his home. He had a family, he had a wife, perhaps kids, I don't recall if he had kids or not, but he had a, a family, at least a small one, and he invited the man into his home in order to feed him, in order to clothe him, and he gave him a bed and a place to live. And it turned out that um, his wife ended up leaving before the homeless man ended up leaving. And, and again, was that a case of him truly loving and caring for that person, or was that a case of him failing in his ministry? Uh, so again, we need to be sharp. We need to be spiritually alert. We need to understand. I realize one thing we can do to avoid being taken advantage of is just swing too far one way just close our heart to other people because we don't want to be taken advantage of but we don't need to go from one extreme to the other we can be finding the mark we can be hitting the mark we can be doing what we're called to do let's get, look at another example in uh, helping other people this could include uh, parents uh, assisting adult children, it could be a range of different circumstances. We need to make a distinction between supporting th their necessary responsibilities in life, helping them to fulfill those responsibilities and being an encouragement to them. That's one of our options. A different uh, option would be enabling bad behavior. Um, uh, rescuing people from their responsibilities. 
For example, if a person has, has behaved badly, if they have consequences to face, um, we might think that loving them is rescuing them from their consequences, but we need to consider perhaps the most loving thing would be letting them deal with their responsibilities because that's the only way they are going to be successful. We can say this, it's going to be the only way they're going to be happy in life. So we need to think about those kinds of things. I, I can recall uh, reading about parents being faced with this dilemma. Um, a, a man who was raised in uh, very difficult circumstances, his parents had uh, very little money, um, they were not able financially to um, help him in life at all. He needed to make his own way. He needed to work hard. Uh, he needed to get his own training. He did all of that. And, and this particular man made, uh, financially speaking, a very big success um, of things. And he, he ended up doing very well, making a lot of money. And then he had children of his own. So then the dilemma was this. Does he... Uh, require his children to do it the way that he did it uh, because it worked for him therefore it would be best for them or is he more helpful does he share of the riches that he has uh, very interesting um, and you can see how uh, a well-intentioned parent could go one way or the other with that question. Um, my personal take on it is this, is that as much as uh, the f man did well with the s circumstances that he faced in life, the fact is, is that his home now with his children, it's different than with his parents because his parents gave him the best they had. Now he has to determine how does he give his children the best that he has. Uh, now he doesn't want to spoil them, he doesn't want to train them to be irresponsible, but on the other hand, uh, is it his responsibility to take what he has and to help them? I believe it is. Uh, I'm not telling him what to do, what he should or shouldn't do. That's his decision to make. I'm saying it's certainly an opportunity, but you would have to be wise as to whether you're helping people to successfully address their responsibilities or whether you're helping people to avoid their responsibilities. Um, there's slightly different uh, circumstance. I recall a family, uh, and I don't know their history, and maybe if I understood their history more, I would understand why they did this but their kids went to public school and uh, you know, not always perfectly behaved, occasionally in trouble, uh, sometimes in the principal's office, sometimes the parents were called in. And they, these particular parents uh, would always side with their children against the principal. Um, I think my take on that is as a parent, you would want to try to discern what happened, uh, get the facts, but if there was any responsibility, I can say this, if it was my kids, if there was any responsibility on their part, if they had done anything wrong, I would want them to face their responsibilities. I would not uh, uh, want to just side with them against the principal. In fact, if, there was, if I could find any rightness with what the principal was doing and saying, I would want to uh, reinforce that in order to encourage my own children to face their responsibilities, which I believe would be um, my best way of loving them. Um, let's continue. Marriages. We need to make a distinction between loving wives and submitting to husbands. Um, we need, need to make a distinction between that and trying to get them to love us or trying to get them to submit to us. Notice how it does not say, and I think this is not, or I think this is extremely uh, important to see this. It doesn't say, husbands, try to get your wives to submit to you. It does not say, wives, try to get your wives, um, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> it does not say husbands try to get your wives to submit to you. It does not say wives try to get your husbands to love you. Uh, that's just getting the wrong twist on things. That's becoming uh, manipulative now. Uh, again, the way that we do it is by facing our own responsibility. If I'm married and I'm a husband and I am married and I am a husband, then my 
focus is on loving my wife. It's fulfilling my responsibility, not trying to find some way to get her to fulfill her responsibility. We need to have confidence in the gospel, in our calling, in the word of God, that if we simply do what God is asking us to do, then it is going to produce the results that we need. Uh, we could look at another um, very modern, very, very current thing in the news. Um, and I don't want to speak much to it because I'm probably not qualified in many ways to address it in a lot of detail, but just to make a, uh, a, an observation about it, Black Lives Matter, that is currently uh, very much a, a hot button topic. Um, it's, as I say, it's in the news. Uh, we need to understand, I believe this, these are going to be two, not, not any deep or intimate experience with my part on this particular issue, but just but two biblical issues. And, and we can observe these two biblical issues as people have always and will always discriminate against those who are different or weaker or fewer in number. That is just a fact of the human race. That's a fact of the fear nature that we discussed earlier. It's wrong. It is sin, and it's going to be common because sin is common in the world, uh, and we stand against that. Uh, now, at the same time, people have always and will always feel their problems are the fault of someone else. And so it becomes a tricky subject, how we deal with it. I'm not saying we don't deal with it, but we need to be aware of both sides, is that um, on one hand, uh, with regard to Black Lives Matter, uh, have black people been discriminated against? Uh, yes, emphatically so. Is it also going to be true, though, that black people not blame other people for their life circumstance, but rather believe the gospel and believe that as they simply fulfill their responsibility to God, that they will be blessed in so doing? Yes, that is also important, and we need to navigate. Again, am I giving all the answers? Decidedly, no, um, but two important perspectives on it. Um, <clears throat> you know, to what degree as a church do we get involved in that? Well, I think the best way we can be involved is by preaching the gospel. Now, what about demonstrating in the streets? Well, I'm a little less certain about that, but here's an obvious fact, is that there have been social movements in history. Many, probably one that comes to mind is the suffragette movement, or in other words, the women um, getting, gaining the right to vote. That was a movement, that was a social movement. Uh, was that necessary? Do we need social movements at times to affect change? Yes, we do. Uh, what, precise, what precise role do we play in that? Well, we need to decide that for ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit. A final example I want to give is the Good Samaritan, one that we spoke of earlier. We know the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, how he found a man half dead in the ditch, and he um, uh, just invested his time, his effort, his care, his love. He spent a day with the man. He used his own money. He paid for his stay at the inn. He paid the innkeeper to continue looking after him. And uh, we also um, lightheartedly gave our own version of it, uh, not a biblical one, but continuing from the uh, point in which the story that Jesus told leaves off, and, and we gave an example of what it might have looked like uh, had he been compelled to stay longer, and if he had have been controlled and manipulated by the wounded man and made to do things that were beyond what he had originally done. Uh, and, and so comparing those two things, uh, what he did, what Jesus said he did was sufficient. He did not need to do more. What he did was truly loving that man. He, he was being a good neighbor to him, which is what Jesus was describing. And he did not have to uh, consent to or participate in any manipulation in order to um, be more loving. In fact, it wouldn't have been more loving. So here we'll finish with these thoughts. Uh, love recognizes the need for others to fulfill their responsibility. Um, other people must meaningfully engage with Christ. There's going to be no way for them to successfully make it other than doing that. We cannot do that for them. We can be loving to them. That's being responsible to them. It is not being responsible for them because it, indeed we can't be. Um, 
So we need to find just where the lines are there. What is appropriate? What isn't appropriate? How far do we go? How much is expected? Uh, again, with the Good Samaritan, there was a certain amount that was expected that, that Jesus told us about. Beyond that, it was not expected. We need to find that out in our relationships. Where does love begin? Where does it end? Where does manipulation start? Where does it end? Uh, we need to have confidence that the gospel works for us so that if all we do is what Jesus told us, to do is that things will work well, we'll be successful, we'll be blessed, and we don't need to resort to manipulating or being manipulated. Uh, we can do successfully those two scriptures we read earlier in 1 Corinthians 13. We can take no account of the evil done to us. We can pay no attention to a suffered wrong, and we can do it in a manner where we don't get taken advantage of. Uh, we can believe the best of every person and do it in a manner where we don't get taken advantage of. So that is my wish for all of us, that we would all be successful, that we would all be wise, that we would all understand the scriptures, that we would do well, that we would be able in the complexities of our own personal lives to be able to sort through these issues. I trust uh, that, uh, that I did a good job today. If I, if, I only, <laughs> if I didn't quite do as good a job as I could have or should have, I trust the Holy Spirit will help all of us to work through these different issues and be successful at it. I know regardless of how good a job I did with the help of the Holy Spirit today, that's always going to be necessary. We're going to need the Holy Spirit with us 24 hours a day helping us and let's pray about it father in jesus name i pray for everybody under the sound of my voice that you would help us all i'm including myself in this prayer that you would help us all to be wise according to the scriptures and to be true lovers of other people and to also be like jesus where we uh, understand that that men don't always have good motives for what they do and that and, and to be careful about that we thank you for helping us in jesus name Amen. Thank you for joining us again today. Have a great week, everybody.